So have you ever heard of coppicing? Coppicing is an old art. It's the art of regrowing trees from a stump. Wikipedia says, coppicing is a traditional method of woodland management, which takes advantage of the fact that many trees make new growth from the stump or roots if cut down. In a coppiced wood, young tree stems are repeatedly cut down to near ground level. In subsequent growth years, many new shoots will emerge, and after a number of years, the coppiced tree is ready to be harvested, and the cycle begins again. So birch trees are traditionally coppiced for firewood on a three or four year cycle. Oak trees can be coppiced over about a 50 year cycle for fencing or construction. Coppicing is interesting. It maintains the trees at a juvenile stage, and a regularly coppiced tree will never die of old age. Some coppiced tree stumps may therefore reach immense ages and, and, and immense sizes, estimating the age from the diameter, and some are so large, as much as 18 feet across, that they appear to have been continuously coppiced for centuries for centuries. <laughs> Even when tree stumps are not intentionally coppiced, they can still grow new trees, typically four to six trees around the edges of the stump. And this fact was obviously well known in biblical times, for Isaiah uses it as an image of the co coming Messiah, a branch regrown from the stump of Jesse. In other words, God is in the business of coppicing the stump of Jesse. The text we're looking at today, Isaiah 11, 1 through 10, is a prophecy of the Messiah who would come and who will come again. In these verses, the branch from the root of Jesse is Jesus, as he was in his first coming, as he will be in his second coming, and as he will be in the coming kingdom. Though these are the three topics, it's a little bit hard to tease out how exactly the past and future portions divide the text up. For Jesus, of course, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But for the sake of the outline, we'll look at verses 1 to 3 with the idea of Jesus as he was in his first coming. Very clear in those verses. Verses 3 to 5, for Jesus as he will be in his second coming and verses 6 to 10, for Jesus as he will be in the coming kingdom. Now, before we begin, let me point out one more feature of the text. The shoot or the branch or the root of Jesse is mentioned in verse 1 and in verse 10. These two verses form bookends to this text. And let us know that all the verses in between are about the same person though they cover a wide span of time and a wide range of characteristics. So let's begin with verses 1 to 3. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. So this is the shoot from the stump of Jesse. This is the coppiced tree regrown. Jesse was a descendant of Judah. And of course, he was the father of David. And when the Old Testament talks about a father or grandfather in this way, it's indicating that all of the descendants are contained in the ancestor. So this is a formal way of referring not only to David, but to the line of kings that followed him. They were the tree that originally had grown up from Jesse. But now, at the time this prophecy foretells, the line of David has been cut down and is merely a stump. 600 years before the coming of the Messiah, the kingship of David's descendants had been cut off by the Babylonian exile. Even after the return of Judah from exile under Ezra and Nehemiah, there had been no king in Jerusalem, for the nation was under the thumb of the Persians and then the Greeks and then the Romans up to the time of Christ. So the kingly line of David, the lineage of Jesse, seemed to be at an end, a dead 
stump to be sure there were still descendants of David, but none of them was king for many years. But now, Isaiah says, from this seemingly lifeless stump, a shoot will come forth. From the roots of the line of David, a branch will come that will bear more fruit. Now, the Jewish rabbis, even before the time of Christ, recognized that this passage referred to the Messiah who had been promised. Even modern Jewish commentators agree that this passage is a messianic prophecy. And it's linked to Isaiah 9, 6, a couple chapters back, the prophecy of a child who would be born unto us. I found one website called Jews for Judaism, a play on Jews for Jesus, that attempted to prove that Jesus was not the one prophesied here, but they did this by first agreeing that these verses did, or for them do, point forward to the Messiah who was to come. So even they recognize this as a messianic prophecy. The second description of the one from the line of David is as a branch, which is also a term used elsewhere for the Messiah. There are at least five other such uses of branch in the Old Testament. Isaiah's already used it once, Isaiah 4, 2. In that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land shall be the pride and honor of the survivors of Israel. In that day, of course, we know is, is frequently shorthand for the day of the Lord or the Messiah's day. In Jeremiah, we find a very clear prophecy. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king, <coughs> excuse me, and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. That, that verse could almost be a summary of today's sermon. Jeremiah repeats much the same thing in chapter 33. In Zechariah, the high priest Joshua, who is a type for Jesus, he's called the branch, and he is the one who is my servant and will branch out from this place and build the temple of the Lord. And finally, in Isaiah 53, the famous chapter that gives the detailed prophecy about Jesus in his suffering and, and resurrection, it says, it says of the suffering servant that he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground, which is almost a cer certainly a reference back to what Isaiah said in today's text. He is the root and the branch of Jesse. Okay, finally, just one more connection to make out of this verse. Some commentators, including some Jewish believers in Jesus, make a connection between this verse and one of the more obscure Old Testament quotations in Matthew. Matthew 2.23 says that after Joseph returned with Jesus from Egypt, he went and lived in a city called Nazareth so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled that he would be called a Nazarene. Now, most of your translations won't have an Old Testament cross-reference for that prophecy. In other words, that they can't find what Matthew was referring to. But a few scholars say that the town name Nazareth is from the Hebrew root netzer, which is the Hebrew word for branch used in Isaiah 11.1 and these other scriptures. In other words, he's from Branch Town, and he will be called the Branch, or the Branch Town guy. Right now, I can't prove that connection any more than anyone else can, but it does sort of make sense and fits. So the root and branch of Jesse is coming. He's coming in the first advent that we celebrate at Christmas to minister, <coughs> excuse me, suffer, die, and rise. He's coming again in the second advent to judge, rule, and then to reign over a kingdom of peace. Verses 2 and 3 are specifically focused on his first coming. Verse 2, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And then the first phrase of verse 3, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. 
You remember that when Jesus announced his ministry in the Gospel of Luke, he didn't quote these verses. He quoted from Isaiah 61. And the verses in Isaiah 61 are, are so similar that they affirm that these verses in Isaiah 11 also apply to Jesus. So quoting from Luke chapter 4, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Okay, so go stick with me here and see how this works. The same Holy Spirit rests on Jesus in both of these verses from Isaiah. Isaiah 61, quoted in Luke 4, tells us what Jesus does. But Isaiah 11, 2 tells us under the same premise of the resting of the Spirit on him, how he does it. First, he does it with wisdom and understanding. Jesus, the Son, blessed by the Father and filled with the Spirit, had perfect wisdom and perfect understanding. We see this, for example, when the Gospels tell us that Jesus knew what was in people's hearts or even knew what people were thinking. We see it when he answers hard and cynical questions in such a way as to overwhelm the questioners. Next, he had the spirit of counsel and might. Isaiah 9, 7 says that Jesus is the wonderful counselor. And we see that, for example, in those deeply individual interactions with Mary and Martha after the death of their brother Lazarus. This is also the spirit of might or power, which we see at work when Jesus calms the storm or feeds the 5,000 or rises from the dead, for that matter. Finally, this is the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. We've already said that Jesus had knowledge of people's hearts, but consider also his prophetic knowledge of the path of suffering and resurrection that he himself would walk. He had knowledge. And then he has the fear of the Lord, mentioned twice at the end of verse 2 and the beginning of Isaiah eleven three. 3, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. What does it mean for Jesus, or this, this branch of Jesse's root, to delight in the fear of the Lord? I mean, isn't Jesus God already? Can he, can he fear himself? Well, no, not exactly. But in his human nature, he did fear the Lord perfectly, better than anyone else had ever done. So we have to remember the way the fear of the Lord is defined. When, one commentator says it this way. The fear of the Lord is responding to God in prayerful, reverent awe, trusting in God completely, and demonstrating an unwavering obedience to his instruction. Now, if you think about it, that's a completely accurate description of the life of Jesus. He was always prayerful, and his prayers were always reverent toward his Father. In fact, he taught us to pray, Father in heaven, hallowed or revered as holy be thy name. Second, man says that fear of the Lord is trusting in God completely. 1 Peter 2.23, when he, Jesus, was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Jesus trusted in God completely. And finally, demonstrating an unwavering obedience. Jesus said, he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And in that critical moment, just prior to his arrest, he said to the Father, not my will, but yours be done. He, he obeyed God completely. So the fear of the Lord is obedience. The fear of the Lord is trust. The fear of the Lord is reverence. Jesus lived in the fear of the Lord. Now, I want to pause here. I've had a couple thoughts since I wrote the bulk of this sermon that I want to just throw in here. Uh, the first of them is this, that this doesn't just happen. 
I mean, this kind of correlation between Isaiah 11 too, right, and, and Jesus as we see him throughout the Gospels is not a coincidence. Jesus was empowered and gifted and characterized by these particular kinds of, of characteristics, wisdom and knowledge and power and counsel, right? It, it's not a coincidence. It's a prophecy that came true in Jesus' life. Second, if you're looking for an application from today's sermon, I mean, mostly this is about Jesus, and our application needs to be to, 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 to glorify him for who he is and what he'll do. But if you're looking for an application, recognize this. You have received the same Holy Spirit that empowered Jesus for ministry. So in addition to the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit, I think it's legitimate for you to ask the Spirit to endow you with these things, with wisdom and knowledge and, and the ability to give good counsel and the power to do what God calls you to do and the fear of the Lord. So that, that could be an application uh, from the text. So these first two verses perfectly characterize Jesus in his first advent. He sprang from the line of David like new life from a dead stump. He was filled with the Spirit, so he lived his life with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. He spoke wisdom into the lives of, the, of his followers. He lived with might and power, healing the sick, raising the dead, multiplying the loaves, calming the sea. And more than that, he lived in the fear of the Lord, doing God's will perfectly out of reverence for his Father, even on the path of sacrifice. The second part of verse 3, through verse 5, show Jesus as he will be in his second advent. It's not that these things were completely absent in his first advent, but the emphasis shifts when he comes again. So verse 3, he shall not judge by what his eyes see, or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. So when Jesus comes again, all of his judgments will be true and righteous. I mean, even as in his first coming they were. He knew people's hearts. He did not judge by what his eyes saw or decide solely by what his ears heard. He, he, he already behaved with perfect righteousness. But when Jesus comes again, the world will see his every judgment and his judgments will be righteous. He alone knows the hearts. And he knows where hypocrisy ends and faith begins in our hearts. So he will embrace those who love him in faith, and he will judge those who don't have that faith. What he'll be looking for is faith. At the end of the parable of the persistent widow, when he talks about this coming judgment, he says this, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The, the parable shows that this judgment by faith will not contradict justice and righteousness as he has taught it to us. We know that the poor and the meek frequently get a injustice and oppression in this fallen world. When he comes again, that will no longer be so forever. He will judge the poor, but he will not judge them because they are poor, as men so often do. In fact, he will decide with equity or fairness for the meek of the earth. I mean, he taught that the meek are blessed and shall inherit the transformed world that it will bring at his second advent. But the proud and the wicked, he will not spare. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Notice, this judgment is not implemented by military might, though he will lead an army at his second coming, but it is with his simple and incredibly powerful word that he will banish the wicked and put an end to injustice. Psalm 2, which is a psalm of the Lord's return, says, I will tell of the decree, the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten.
seed, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Our king's rod of iron, according to Isaiah, is the word of his mouth. His breath is the instrument of judgment. In Revelation, we learn that in his return, he is first the word of God, and then from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So then in the second coming, in the day of the Lord, we see something very different than the first advent. At Christmas, we celebrate his humility and his sacrifice. But as we look forward, we celebrate his righteous rule and reign. All his judgments will be right. Verse 5. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. One commentator explained this very succinctly. He said, in the Near Eastern dress styles, the belt or sash was the garment that gave stability to the whole ensemble. And to gird the loins, as the King James puts it, was to prepare to do the work at hand. The Messiah would be prepared in character for his work of judgment. His character, unlike that of any other king, is perfectly suited to judge with equity and with righteousness. And when he comes, he will do that. Now, we could say so much more about his second coming, the day of the Lord. For the unrighteous and the wicked on earth, it will be a day of judgment. We see that often in the Old Testament. A few years ago, we studied the book of Joel, which chapter 2 begins, Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy hill. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. But for those who belong to Jesus, it will be a day of resurrection, a day of transformation, a day of joy. I had the opportunity to preach at the funeral service for Joe Bartee's mom this week. And the verses we use when we do a funeral point us to Christ's second advent. 1 Corinthians 15, for example, says, We shall not all sleep, that is, we shall not all die before Jesus returns, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Right? So, so for those of us who believe the day of the Lord is a day of, of transformation, this is the moment in Isaiah 11 of Christ's second advent. Arguably, it's a series of moments. Maybe some of this is before his millennial reign on earth. Maybe some of it is after. But as in most of the tests we'll look at in this series, it's not the actual second advent itself that's the focus. The focus is the outcome of the second advent. It's what the world will be like after Jesus' return. And that's where the rest of today's verses go. Isaiah 11, 6 through 10. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the outer's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day the root of Jesse who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Shalom, the word for peace, is not used in these verses. But they are a beautiful picture of shalom, or what we often call human flourishing, or the way it ought to be. Now, I have to say that this prophecy is not clear as to the timing, 
parts of it feel like it could be during the millennium when Jesus reigns on earth, while parts of it would seem to fit better in the new heavens and the new earth. I'm not going to try to tease all that out today because what I want us to see is that after Christ's return, he will reign over a kingdom of peace. Peace. This peace is portrayed as a lack of antagonism between pairs of creatures who are normally antagonistic and a kingdom of safety even for a little child in what should have been danger. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard and the goat, the lion and the calf. In our present ecology, the lion and leopard and wolf and bear are designed to catch and kill and eat the lamb and the goat and the calf but not in that new kingdom. Furthermore, verse 6, a little child shall lead them. A little child has never been safe with a lion or a bear or a wolf in our experience, but he or she will be on that day. Even the nursing child, very young, will play without danger over the hole of a cobra. And the weaned child, a little older, will put his hand into the den of an adder. Again, without danger. Furthermore, verse 7, the cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. So, this is a radical change to the ecology of the earth. Not the way things are now, but a, but a pervasive peace going forward. Now, it is possible to read this as the ecology of the Temple Mount. <coughs> the place in Jerusalem where Christ returns. I mean, we can't read it that way, for it says in verse 9, they shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. So maybe it's localized. Normally in the Old Testament, the holy mountain is another name for Mount Zion. It's Jer Jerusalem. It's environs. But, and a few chapters further into Isaiah, the prophecy says, and in that day, a great trumpet will be blown, <coughs> excuse me, and those who were lost in the land of Assyria and those who were driven out to the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain at Jerusalem. So it's localized. But at other places, it's used for something much larger. In Isaiah 25, we read that on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food a feast of well-aged wine, of food rich and full of marrow, of aged wine well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. So that appears to be something much more than a local phenomenon, though in fact it was on the slopes of Mount Zion that Jesus swallowed up death forever. So is this a local suspension of nature red in tooth and claw, or is this a complete reversal of it? Honestly, I don't know. I'm part of a fallen ecology, and I can't imagine what a revised ecology with no more death would look like. But clearly, when Jesus comes, there will be a radical change. There will be a radical culture of peace and godliness over the whole earth. Verse 9, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Every place in the world will acknowledge and worship God. I have always loved this phrase which appears not only here, but in Habakkuk 2.14. The, the last song we're going to sing today, Glory Will Cover the Earth, is based on this text. And I love that song. But when I was a little kid, probably in choir, we sang another song with this text that has stayed with me all these years that I still have memorized and that I still sing in my head pretty frequently, Oh, I hadn't heard anybody else sing it until I found it on YouTube. Is that sad?
if, uh, if I had paid two cents for every time I've sung those phrases in the last 55 years, Robert Shaw, who wrote that melody, well, he's dead. But he would be way richer when he died. Right? Nearer and nearer hastens the time, the time that shall surely be when the earth shall be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. It's coming. Verse 10, in that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Notice how Isaiah has come back to the root of Jesse. All of this was about the work of the root of Jesse, his first advent, his second advent, and what his kingdom will be like. And the root of Jesse is Jesus. We know this, by the way, because at the very end of the book of Revelation, when everything has been revealed, Jesus says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and descendant of David, the bright and morning star. He is. And in that day, he shall stand as a signal for the peoples. Some translations say he shall stand as a banner for the peoples. Uh, a banner or something you rally around, or right? gather to in a parade or even on a battlefield. Jesus is the banner. He stands as a banner. And in that day, he draws all people to himself. Um, so as we transition to communion, really it's a couple of verses there in Isaiah 12. 